He was one of the great midfielders of 20th century football and now after 50 years in the game as a player, manager and Premier League Academy boss, Liam Brady has written the story of his life. He joins us on Roundtable exclusively to talk about it. There aren't many players in the world who've swapped shirts with Diego Maradona, but Liam Brady is one of them. From Arsenal to Juventus, Inter Milan and Ireland, his creativity and genius brought him legendary status. Liam Brady was spotted by Arsenal as a schoolboy playing football in Dublin in the 70s and went on to win the FA Cup with the London club before moving to Italy. He enjoyed seven seasons in Serie A, which was then the best league in the world. His time in Italy brought two league titles with Juventus and he also played for Sampdoria before moving to Inter Milan. Brady remains one of Ireland's most popular players ever and went on to a career in management before then being appointed boss of Arsenal's academy. He's still regarded as a legend at the Premier League club. And I'm delighted to say Liam Brady joins me here in the studio. Liam, welcome to Roundtable. You've finally decided to tell the story of your life Liam Brady, born to be a footballer. Why now? Uh, well, the book's just come out now, and uh, but uh, it's been in the, in the making for a couple of years, and I suppose it was COVID that got me started, you know. Um, I had had nearly 50 years in the game, and uh, uh, when you couldn't get out of your house with the COVID uh, uh, virus, uh, I started to research and remember things and ring a few people around and start putting it down on paper and it's out now. And tell me, your life in football has been amazing. It all started at a boys club in Dublin. That's right, yeah, St. Kevin's Boys in Dublin. Uh, I was spotted in the local park playing for St. Kevin's. I was asked to go to Arsenal on trial at 13 years of age, which I did and I did well in my trial and then uh, at 15, I was able to leave school then and come and join the ground staff at Arsenal. And you were called an apprentice professional then. So you had to work to get a professional contract and you could get that when you were 17. And I did that, I achieved that. I got it when I was 17 on my 17th birthday. And then a few months later, I made my debut for Arsenal and I played in the first team for the next seven years. And that club has formed such a huge part of your life, hasn't it? I mean, lifelong friends, incredible memories, and you're a club legend. Yes, well, it's, it's my club, although I played for several clubs. I always feel that Arsenal is my club because they developed me from being a kid uh, into, a, uh, into a footballer that could have a career in the game. So, yes, it's my club, and I'm still very attached to it. I go to the games when I can. Still got a lot of great friends, my ex-teammates. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's part of my life, as you say, Enda. You won the FA Cup at Arsenal in 1979, a very, very famous final at Wembley, beating Manchester United. And then you decided to leave. Yes, well, I had another year to go after that, and we very nearly won the European Cup Winners' Cup. Uh, we got beat in the final by Valencia. We nearly won the FA Cup. We got beat in the final by West Ham. But on the way to play Valencia, we played Juventus in the semi-final of the uh, of the Cup Winners' Cup, and uh, I played pretty well against uh, against Juve, and uh, it was a time when the Italians were going to open their borders to foreign players again. Only one per team, uh, and I was lucky enough to be the man they picked. So I went to Turin and had two great years at Juventus. You won the league title twice, Serie A, and the bulk of that. Italian team that went on and won the World Cup were your Juve teammates. They were, yeah. Dino Zoff, the legendary Italian goalkeeper, Cabrini, Shirea, the great sweeper, Gentile, the killer who marked Maradona and Zico in, the, in two of the World Cup games that year in 82. And then Tardelli in midfield and Calcio, uh, Cabrini was left back. Yeah, seven players, seven Juventus players figured in that World Cup. So tell me, do you think if you hadn't been Irish, if you'd have been Italian, would they have taken you to the World Cup as part of that squad? 
Oh, I'd like to think so. <laughs> I was like, if you're the foreign player, player for Juventus, uh, I think it means uh, something. And I, I was given the number 10 shirt, which is, is a very heavy shirt. It's a very heavy shirt, you know, because you're, uh, you're expected to do good things. And I didn't let them down, I don't think. And yeah, I would have liked to have thought I could have got into that squad anyway. Did you ever pinch yourself, a young lad from North Inner City, Dublin, and you're wearing number 10? at Juventus with the greatest players in the world and the greatest league in the world? Uh, no, I did. I just probably uh, took it in my stride. Um, I'm a professional and that's what I was paid to do, you know. So I had a great time in Italy. As you know, I left Juventus. So they replaced me with Michel Platini, not a bad, bad man to, <laughs> to get yourself replaced by. Uh, and then I went to Sampdoria. It was a smashing club in, uh, in Genoa. And Tell Trevor Francis, it. Trevor Francis yeah. was my, they opened it up to two foreigners then. So Trevor came and he was my partner at, uh, at, at Sampdoria. But uh, the whole league opened up to the best players in the world. And, you know, we had great Brazilians like Junior, Socrates, Falcao, Zico, and then South Americans, Bertone, Passarella, and then Maradona, of course, came in 1985, I think it was, from Barcelona, and he was the best player in the world. Let's go back to 82 when you're leaving Juventus. How did that come about and what did it feel like? Tell us about that fateful weekend. Well, uh, it came out of the blue. Um, I got a phone call from an agent saying, you know, he could get me back to Manchester United or Arsenal. And I said, what do you mean get me? I have another year to go at Juventus. Oh, he said, no, we've heard that they've signed Platini. They'd already signed Boniek as their second, the Polish striker. And then they said to me, we've, we've, we have it on good authority, they're going to sign Platini. It was a complete shock to me uh, because we we're at top of the league again. I'd won it the year before. But the guy who owns Juventus was a guy called Gianni Agnelli, and he was the uncrowned king of Italy. He had, uh, was a very, very wealthy man, and I think he always wanted Platini in his team. Platini was his favourite player, and I had to make way for it. It was a bit disappointing, but, you know, there's ups and downs in this career, and you have to shake yourself, shake it off. And uh, I went to Sampdoria, and I had a great time at Sampdoria. Then I went to Inter Milan and played with, in the San Siro with the great Karl-Heinz Rummenigge and Alta Belli and Zenga, uh, all these Italian greats as well. So I had a marvellous time in there. Playing in the best league, as you said, Maradona came... So many people left England to come as well. Graham Souness left Liverpool, Trevor Francis, who I mentioned, you know, and then ultimately Paul Gascoigne came to Lazio, which Paul Gascoigne was the best English player of his generation, I believe. What was it like playing against Diego Armando Maradona? Difficult. <laughs> Couldn't get the ball off him, you know. He just had this magic about him and he was like a rubber ball. He had a low centre of gravity. Couldn't knock him off the ball. He never dived. I don't remember. I remember diving or, or, or trying to cheat anything. So um, I, f I found him to be a really nice man as well as the greatest player in the world. He was, he was okay as a, as a person. You have a very special jersey from a game, Ireland against Argentina in 1979. We're looking at that picture now that I took around your house one day. Um, tell me the story about how you ended up with Maradona's jersey. Well, he came on a sub uh, for the second half and uh, I'd seen him play a few days before in Scotland where he started the match and he was absolutely magnificent. He scored a couple of goals against Scotland. And, uh, and then he, uh, he came on the second half and we were kind of playing in the same area. And I said to him, yeah, we swap shorts, yeah? And he said, yeah, see, you know. Uh, Made me a good scout. He was only 18 years of age, and I thought, well, this, player, this boy is going to be some player. And he turned out to be possibly... Do you think he was the greatest? Absolutely. Of his generation, yeah, absolutely. The generation before Pelé, then there was Maradona, and then there was Messi. International football, what did it mean to you being from Dublin, playing for Ireland, representing your country, travelling the world, and your name becoming legendary everywhere? Well... Uh, I don't know about legendary everywhere, and but uh, it was great. I played 72 times, played all over the world, uh, 
it showed me the world, mostly in Europe. Played in Turkey a good few times. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, it was tough, you know. It was very intimidating. They're, you know, they're very, very behind their national team. Passionate. Passionate, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and they've got better, haven't they? Turkey have got really better over the years. When I started to play against them in the early 70s, they were just developing as a nation in, as regards football. But uh, they've done really well since then. They've been at World Cups and European Championships. Uh, it's great to see the see the world with football, you know. And I try to embrace that. It's uh, it, it really is a privileged lifestyle to be a footballer, and not every footballer realizes that. Just on that point, you ran Arsenal's academy for what a decade. What was that like? Going from being you'd been a player, you'd been a manager and a coach. And now you're dealing with the modern generation of young fella coming through. Well, that was a lovely job. It was a great job, a really satisfying job, a fulfilling job. There was less pressure on than management. Management, you have to get immediate results. But with young players, you can develop them over the course of time. And I was actually there nearly 18 years, Enda, as, as, as academy manager. And we saw some great players coming through. And uh, you have this picture on the wall there, I think, uh, Bukayo Saka is in that picture. Uh, Balogun, who the club have just sold for 30 million to Monaco. And the lad holding the cup up is Mark McGuinness, who's having a fine career at Cardiff City in the championship. And I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in the Premier League. So they don't all make it at Arsenal, but we try and develop them so they get a career elsewhere. How much pride do you take out of seeing young guys come in? They're schoolboys when they come in, aren't they? Eight sometimes. Eight years old. Babies, I would call them. Yeah. Seven and eight. Yeah. How do you how do you spot that talent that well, you think he up, can go and become a Premier League? Well, player? this is up to the scouts, you know. And you know, if you if you go to a match or I go to a match, it's easy to tell the best player on the pitch. Uh, it's not so easy to tell the one that could be something special in a few years. So, but that's what scouts do. That's what they get paid for. And talking of getting paid. Young lads nowadays, teenage millionaires playing football. Yeah, that's well, that's the name of the game. That's that's what football has has developed into. It's no longer a, a hobby for for people who own football clubs. The people who own football clubs now are businessmen, big businessmen all over the world. Stan Kroenke, who owns Arsenal, is one of the biggest businessmen in the world. You know, you saw Abramovich with Chelsea. Uh, there's now another American in there at Chelsea. Uh, Manchester United owned by the Glazer family. It's a huge business and, uh, you know, the money's there. The TV are paying, uh, are paying the Premier League is one of the best leagues in the world. So these players are getting the rewards that you, you've mentioned there and good luck to them. And compared to what you were on as a schoolboy at Arsenal, I mean, this is different galaxies. Absolutely. We, we, you know, if you come out in my day, if you had a 10, 12 year career in the game and you come out with your own house with no mortgage, all your mortgage paid, you've done well. Now they can buy maybe 10 houses with what they, uh, what they earn all over the world. They could have a house all over the world. What happens to the lads who don't make it? Well, that's, that's uh, something they have to handle. You know, some of them go into obviously other walks of life. Well, I'd like to think that they always remember that I was a kid at Arsenal or a kid at Manchester United, or a kid at Liverpool. It doesn't work out from everybody. It's only a small percentage make it. And we t try and tell them that when they come, you know. Keeping their feet on the ground and their parents' feet on the ground is particularly important. Because sometimes it's the parents that can get carried away more than the boy. So is it a case of the dad or mother living their dreams through the child, or is it an economic thing that they just think this is our best chance? Bit of both. Bit of both, yeah. yeah. They obviously want their son to be famous, but they, they know that if he's going to become famous, he's going to bring a lot of money into the household, you know. And we've seen that with players all down through the, the ages, you know. So it's a, it, it's a great profession. Uh, I think the kids get looked after much better now than in my day. We had, we had dressing room duties, cleaning the stadium, cleaning the first team players' boots. That no longer goes on. These kids can now concentrate on, on being the best that they can with their talent. They also get an education on top of it, uh, a formal education on top of it. And they come out well-rounded people who can get on in life. 
big influence on your life was Giovanni Trapattoni, legendary player for Italy and manager at AC Milan and elsewhere, and did achieve so much in the game as, as a player and a manager. What was it like being around him all the time? He was one of the best coaches I've ever had. You know, when he, when when you're you're not really a manager in Italy, you're the coach, and then you have a president or a director of football. A bit like the system now that exists in in the English Premier League. You know, you have a coach who doesn't necessarily make all the decisions regarding the football club. So Trapattoni concentrated on the, on the on the team. He has some great players. We've already mentioned them at Juventus, but he had a way about him that everybody was treated equally. There was no favourites. Uh, he had uh, the ultimate respect from all his players. He was just a really brilliant coach who knew his stuff. And uh, he won, I think, in four different countries, he won the league, and uh, that's some going. And he did really well for Ireland as well. He quali qualified him for, I think it was the 20... Euro 2012. Uh, 2012, yeah. Jack Charlton was Ireland manager in 1986. You were in your prime. Tell us... About that relationship? Well, I wouldn't have said I was in my prime and I was coming to 30 years of age. So Jack had a way he wanted football played that probably wasn't suitable to the way I played football. So we had this kind of, uh, we were at loggerheads a bit at the beginning. But, you know, if I wanted to play, I had to adapt. And I did so and we ended up qualifying for the 88 Euros in Germany when only eight teams in Europe qualified. So that's a real achievement for a yeah. small country like Ireland to get amongst the last eight in Europe. Uh, and then I got um, I got injured before that tournament, which meant I, meant, uh, meant I couldn't go. So I never got to play in a World Cup or a Euros because I ran out of time, really. Uh, maybe with another manager, I could have gone to the 1990 World Cup in Italy. Um, but Jack wanted football played in a certain way and he wanted players strong midfield players up and down the pitch. I probably didn't fit into that role. And tell me, what would it have meant to you to have gone to Euro 88 or Italia 90? Everything. To represent your country at that level would, would have been everything. Um, and I'd had 12 years, 13 years of trying. And then when we get there, I couldn't go because I was injured. Uh, so a bit sad. But all in all, I've had an absolutely brilliant career. And the book, tells that, you know, I'm a very lucky man. And then in later life, you became a television pundit, very, very famous in Ireland to a new generation of sports fans who were watching football matches on TV and you were in the studio. How did that transition happen and how did you enjoy it? Well, it was, it was great. You just get paid for talking about football. <laughs> I can talk about football all day, uh, as most people can and have an opinion and, and you know, you watch a match and you just have to be able to narrate what you've just seen in in uh, in, in a way that people can understand it. So it was easy. Uh, I felt it was easy and I had some great companions uh, along the line with John Giles and Eamon Dunphy. John Giles had been a great player for Leeds and then we had Graham Souness. And I started as the boy, I ended up as the senior analyst at the end. Yeah, and tell me, a lot of young people watching you on TV, they wouldn't remember you winning league titles with Juventus, playing for Inter Milan, playing against Maradona. So that brought your name to a whole new generation as well, didn't it? Well, it did, yes, yeah. And then I brought this film out uh, about my career that came out last year, and it showed a lot of stuff that nobody would have seen. You uh, speaking Italian? Well, also me playing in Italy <laughs> and scoring a few goals and making a few goals. So. That was nice. I've finished up now with a film, with a book, and retiring from uh, punditry, and uh, I'm comfortable with it. I want to talk about some of the personalities that you've been friends with over the years. Paolo Rossi, what was he like? He was smashing, yeah. Very unassuming man. Um, you know, always up for a laugh. The first year I had with him, he came, he was banned over some scandal betting scandal that he he insisted he was you know not involved in but he had to wait most of the season to play and he played in the third last game of the season uh, when we won the league for the second time on with me and i made his goal is in his comeback game uh, a free kick a little ball to the near post he was very very clever in the box he was a bit like gary lineker was in his day or, you know 
He was uh, a, a, a goal scorer, a born goal scorer, took up great positions. Um, and he played three games in the league. We ended up winning the league. And then he went off to the 82 World Cup and ended up top goal scorer. Became which, a legend. Absolutely, yeah. Marco Tardelli, he scored in the World Cup final in 1982. You're very, very good friends. What's he like? He's a great bloke, yeah. He's, he, he took me under his wing when I went to Turin. I couldn't speak the language, but he went out of his way so much to help me. He helped me find an apartment. He helped me furnish the apartment. Uh, he would take me out for meals and, you know, help with the language and things like that. Vice versa, he wanted to learn English. So my wife used to uh, teach him and, and Paolo and, and, and a friend of theirs uh, English. So uh, it was a, a, a swap, you know, but uh, he was a great bloke. A uh, bit crazy when he went on the field, when he scored that goal in the 82 World Cup final. His celebration is, uh, is second to none, isn't it? And tell me, you mentioned your wife, Sarah. She is a wonderful lady. How important has she been in your life, agreeing to move to Italy, fitting in, minding children? Yeah, well, look, you know, if you, if you, you uh, a footballer doesn't always stay at the same club, you know? You might be your decision to leave, like I left Arsenal, or when I left Sampdoria, it was my decision. Or it might be the club's decision, like Juventus, you know, uh, letting me go and replacing me with Platini. So you have to uproot and go to uh, go through the process of moving, and you need a wife who's open-minded and realizes that this is this is the life of a footballer. And we've we've lived in so many places. We've lived we lived in London. We lived in uh, in Turin. We lived in Genoa. We lived in Glasgow. We lived in Como. We lived, you know, you're you're a bit of a nomad when you can when you're a professional footballer. Not all of them. Some of them stay at the same club, like Dave O'Leary stayed at Arsenal all his career. But, you know, for others, you have to move about and you need a wife who understands that that's the situation, that's your profession, and adapts to it. And tell me, what advice would you give to any young player, boy or a girl now, starting out in the game? The women's game is so important now compared to your day. Yeah, it's big. Would you, it's would you be... say to people, take the opportunity, go abroad? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's 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 not only opens your football mind up, but it opens your your uh, your whole person. Uh, you know, you learn about another culture. You might learn another language, which is a brilliant thing to do. Uh, and get to know all these countries uh, is is fantastic. So, yeah, I would say to these young players now, be dedicated. That's what it's all about. You know, don't get carried away yourself if you're at it club like Arsenal or, or Manchester United, you have to put the work in if you're gonna if you're gonna reap the rewards afterwards. Who was your favorite teammate, whether club or country? Favorite teammate? Uh, ooh, I'd have to say uh, I, I couldn't choose one above any other and uh, name a few. <laughs> a few. Sammy Nelson was a great pal of mine at Arsenal. Uh, uh, Tardelli obviously at Juventus. Um, Trevor Francis, who passed away a few months ago, and that was terrible news. Trevor Francis at Sampdoria, he was a good buddy. And Rummenigge, uh, Karl Heinz Rummenigge, the great German uh, attack, attacker, um, striker, was uh, was my big mate in uh, in Milan in Inter. So I've had a few big ones. Most difficult opponent? I'd say soonest, both in England and then when he came. I thought I got rid of him when I went to Italy, and then he followed me over there and. Uh, Crunched and crunched me in Italy as well. Soon as I would say. And tell me, the modern game, VAR gets talked about a lot. What, where do you stand on that? I like it. Uh, you know, we've had some strange decisions over recent weeks, but I think that's down to the people making the decisions. It's not down to the actual technology. Um, when I was playing for Ireland, I felt hard done by on several occasions, whether we had goals disallowed or people had, had scored goals against us. And I think if we had VAR, I would have got my chance to play in a World Cup or a European Championship. It happened too many times to a small country like Ireland. I've often thought that it may be the realms of conspiracy here, but as an Ireland fan, I always thought they didn't want us in the club, that we were too small. And a lot of refereeing decisions in your games in particular, Belgium, I remember, away. Very, very difficult to get results against these teams. 
Yeah, and uh, you know, there has to be, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you have to be suspicious of what was going on in there, you know, and that's why I'm all for VAR, I'm all for it, because if there's a ball goes over the line or if, it's, if a goal is clearly onside and a linesman, you know, flags for offside and you lose, the, you, you lose your goal, um, so many times that happened to us, and that's why I'm all for the technology that exists now. Liam, if you could travel back to North Inner City, Dublin, and see 10-year-old Liam and tell him you're going to play for Arsenal, Juventus, Inter Milan, Ireland, what would he have said? I wouldn't have believed you, would he? You know, it's, uh, it's a bit of a fairy tale, really, isn't it? You know, so... My, my determination was to play in England, but I never thought, I never envisaged me going to play in a country like Italy and play with all these great players. Uh, but I put the work in and I got the rewards. And Liam, how would you like your footballing life to be remembered? You've written, the cover of the book says it all, born to be a footballer. I mean, it was almost fate, wasn't it, that you achieved everything you achieved in the game? Well, it was a, a, a lot of sport in my family and a lot of footballers in my family. I had three brothers who were professional footballers who were older than me. So I had them to look up to. How would I want to be remembered? Just, you know, as somebody who entertained people when I went on the pitch. Well, Liam, my first ever game watching Ireland was May 1987, Ireland-Brazil. We won 1-0. You scored the goal. I travelled up from Wexford. I was 11 years old. And you've been my boyhood hero and my friend in life. Thank you for coming on Roundtable. You're very welcome, Enda. Thanks, Liam. So that is the end of this very special edition of Roundtable. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can see more on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But from me, Enda Brady, and my boyhood hero, Liam Brady, thank you for watching.